வணக்கம் குட் ஈவினிங் எவ்ரி ஒன் ஐ முகமது அலி ஐ பி த ஹோஸ்ட் ஃபார் திஸ் ஈவினிங் அண்ட் ஐ டேக் கிரேட் பிளேஷர் இன் வெல்கமிங் யூ டு சர்ஜனஸ் டு செட்டலர்ஸ் டெமல்ஸ் இன் சவுத் இஸ்ட் ஏஷியா அண்ட் சிங்கப்பூர் வெபினா சீரீஸ் திஸ் சீரீஸ் இஸ் ப்ராட் யூ பை தி இண்டியன் ஹெரிட்டேஜ் சென்டர் வித் தி ஜெனரல் சப்போர்ட் ஆஃப் தி டெமல் லாங்குவேஜ் லேர்னிங் அண்ட் ப்ரொமோஷன் கமிட்டி Tamil Language Council and Yuva Bharati International School. Now, in December 2019, the Indian Heritage Center and the Institute of Policy Studies co-published and launched Surgeoners to Settlers, Tamils in Southeast Asia and Singapore, a two-volume publication on Tamil diaspora. Tamil diaspora in Southeast Asia and Singapore in particular. Leading up to the launch of the Tamil version of this publication in 2021, This webinar series presents the research of four authors featured in the publication including Professor John Mixig, Dr. Tosin Sarkar, Professor Sunil Amrit and Ms. K. Kanakalata. And a guest speaker Dr. John Guy joined the series as well. The series is moderated by Mr. Arun, Mr. Arun Makinan who is the co-editor of the publication. Now for today's uh, webinar. Migration is not merely a nostalgic narrative it is a very serious business and it has always been in fact for many of us here our personal history begins as one of a migrants and our history begins with the crossing of the bay of bengal in this respect this evening we are delighted to have you join us for the session in the surgeons to settle webinar series featuring professor sunil amrit Sunil Amrit is a professor of history at Yale University and um, he will be joined by Arun Mahindran as the chair for the session. Now as most of us know Arun at least most of us in Singapore know Arun he has been a steadfast champion of research and inquiry into Singapore's Tamil heritage most recently he mooted and steered the Tamil Digital Heritage Project a community driven project aimed at creating a digital collection of Singapore's Tamil literary and performance works. Arun is also special research advisor at the Institute of Policy Studies Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy National University of Singapore. He is also director Center for Singapore Tamil Culture which is a voluntary organization that promotes interculturalism. Publications that he has edited include Sejanus to Settlers Tamils in Southeast Asia and Singapore as well as Singapore Chronicles a 50 volume book series commemorating Singapore's 50th anniversary. It is now my honor to invite Arun to uh, introduce Professor Amit Arun. Thank you Ali and uh, good evening to all. Though the world is uh, still in a somber mood uh, and Singapore too is I would say uh, many of us are basking in the afterglow of the Gregorian New Year in January and also uh, Pungal uh, festival, the harvest festival, which is considered by many Tamils as their New Year too. And with the anticipation of another New Year, Chinese New Year, just around the corner. So to all of you a uh, belated or advanced happy new year greetings uh, from this side uh, Indian Heritage Center and uh, and myself the topic today is presence as palimpsest tamil diaspora in southeast asia you know the word palimpsest as many of you know suggests that things that are written over either on a piece of paper or any writing material there were already some writing and then somebody else comes erases it and writes over it that is palimpsest this is an interesting framework for what you are about to hear because many of you who have followed this series in the past already know that tamils were here tamil presence was here more than 2000 years ago and yet most of us tamils as well as non tamils can only remember the tamil history 
since the colonial times, the, especially the British colonial times, and that's just about 200 years. So between 2,000 years ago and 200 years ago, it would appear there was not much. But that is not true. This is what our speaker calls the forgotten history of the Bay of Bengal. And in one of his books, uh, it's called actually the crossing of the crossing the Bay of Bengal, the furies of nature and the fortunes of migrants. He actually mentions that between 1840 and 1940, some 28 million people crossed the Bay of Bengal. It was clearly one of the greatest human migration, but as he claims, it is the least well-known. So you can see that there is a selective amnesia about the kind of history that didn't quite fit in with whatever was the current paradigm. So this evening, we have the opportunity to revive, to remember some of that forgotten history. And to do that for us is Professor Sunil Amrit, who, as uh, Ali just now said, is with uh, Yale. And he is the Renu Anand Dawan Professor of History and also the current chair of South Asian Studies Council at Yale University. His research focuses on movements of people as well as ecological processes that have conduct connected South and Southeast Asia. Amrit's area of particular interest include environmental history, the history of migration, and the history of public health. He is a 2017 MacArthur Fellow and the recipient of the 2016 Infosys Prize in Humanities. Amrit's most recent book is called Unruly Waters, a history of the struggle to understand and control the monsoon in modern South Asia. It was shortlisted for the 29 Kundil Prize and was reviewed in Nature, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Review of Books. Very eminent uh, publications. His previous book, which I just showed you, uh, Crossing the Bay of Bengal, was awarded the American Historical Association's John F. Richards Prize in South Asian History in 2014 and was selected as an editor's choice by the New York Times Book Review. Uh, Amrit also serves on the editorial boards of the American Historical Review and Modern Asian Studies, and he's one of the series editors of the University Press series called Histories of Economic Life. Amrit is currently uh, working on an environmental history of the modern world. That's a, a huge subject. And other projects, uh, his other projects include collaborative research with Professor David Jones of Harvard University on the history of air pollution and health in India, and a new collaboration with the Professor Akiyuki Kawasaki of Tokyo University on water-related disasters and inequality, focusing on four cities in the Bay of Bengal region. Before coming to Yale, Amrit was the inaugural Mehra Family Professor of South Asian History at Harvard University, where uh, between 2015 to 2020, where he also served as co-director of the Joint Center for History and Economics. From 2006 to 2015, he taught at Birkbeck College at the University of London. Amrit received his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Cambridge, where he then held a research fellowship 
at Trinity College. But I would say the most important qualification among all this is the fact that he grew up in Singapore in his formative years. And I think now you all know where his extraordinary brilliance comes from. I'll talk to him about that later, but for now it is my great pleasure, delight, and honor to invite Professor Sunil Amrith to give his talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Arun, for an overly generous introduction, and thank you to Nalina, to the Indian Heritage Center, for inviting me. Um, it's minus 15 degrees here in the northeast of the United States, so believe me when I say I wish I was with all of you in Singapore on a balmy evening, but I'm glad to be able to connect with you all the same. I was honored to contribute a chapter to these two volumes so beautifully edited by Mr. Arun and by Nalina, from Sojourners to Settlers. And for those of you who haven't seen the books there, um, as well as being very wide ranging, they're visually beautiful, very nicely illustrated volumes. Um, I'm delighted that a Tamil translation is, is soon to be published, that's, that's wonderful. I'd like to begin by reflecting on that title, Sojourners to Settlers. And in some ways that's a very common pattern in the global history of migration. And some might say it is particularly characteristic of migration within Asia. I could imagine a book with the same title, for example, being written about the Chinese in Southeast Asia. And indeed, Professor Wang Gangwu, one of Singapore's most distinguished historians, has written extensively about the idea of the sojourner. Um, there's a journal called Sojourn, also published from Singapore, one of the leading journals of Southeast Asian studies. So this is an idea that I think has resonance across communities. Settler is a more complicated word. We often refer to settler societies to describe those places where Europeans moved in large numbers, displacing violently indigenous people, North America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. In the 19th century, there was an idea that Asian migrants were sojourners and European migrants were settlers, that you were either a sojourner or a settler. And I think one of the things that we are doing with this project is, is to really to reimagine that term settler, to imagine what that means in the context, specific context of post-colonial Southeast Asia. And I'll come back to that question of, of settlers and sojourners um, at the end of my talk. But I'd like to begin by thinking about different roots of diasporic identity in the Tamil and more broadly, the South Asian diaspora. This is an installation from the brilliant Mauritian artist Shiraz Beju, and it's called Ephemeral Coast. It's on display at the moment at the, uh, the wonderful exhibition at the Boston College Museum of Art called Indian Ocean Currents. And sadly, the opening of the exhibition coincided with the pandemic. And so um, a lot of it is virtual for the time being. Ephemeral Coast. And it's a haunting installation that shows the arrival of indentured workers in Mauritius. Many of them were Tamil, uh, also Bihari. And they came from many different parts of the Indian subcontinent. So this is one root of Tamil and South Asian heritage, a story of upheaval and uprooting, and of cultural struggle to preserve culture and memory. The idea really is that the migrants brought a whole culture to a new place where it took root. I'd like to suggest though that Tamil heritage in Southeast Asia is a very different story. And it's different for some of the reasons that Mr. Arun has already alluded to. It's different because of the longevity of the connections between India and Southeast Asia. Whereas when the first Indian laborers were taken to Mauritius, often against their will under contracts of indenture, there'd been very few prior contacts, if any at all, between especially Tamil Nadu and Mauritius. That was simply not the case when it came to movement to Southeast Asia, which was centuries old. Unlike the plantation colonies of the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean, there were these century long and very deep bonds across the Bay of Bengal. We can see that across the region. 
We can see that in the landscape. We can see that in popular culture. We can see it in language. When the Indian poet and sage Rabindranath Tagore traveled to Southeast Asia in the 1910s and the 1920s, it was those ancient bonds that struck him. This is a picture of Tagore um, in Indonesia. He visited Borobudur, he went to Bali. 1927, he visited Thailand and he had an audience with King Rama VII. He delivered a lecture on Indian art history at the National Museum and he visited Ayutthaya. And he wrote his poem to Siam. And I quote from that poem, I come a pilgrim at thy gate, O Siam, to offer my verse to the endless glory of India, sheltered in thy home, away from her own deserted shrine, to bathe in the living stream that flows in thy heart. And notice the contrast there between the deserted shrine and the living stream. And Tagore's argument was in a sense that uh, the homeland of this Hindu Buddhist culture um, was in some sense deserted and depleted and that it was in Southeast Asia that these traditions continued to live. The great Indologist and translator of Sangam Tamil literature, A.K. Ramanujan, also turned to Southeast Asia for a powerful example in his classic essay, 300 Ramayanas. He pointed out how central the Rama story has been in Thai life, but highlighted the distinctive and original characteristics of the Thai Ram Kien, not a translation of the original so much as a reworking, a reinterpretation and a reinvigoration. But if we look at views like Tagore's, like Ramanujan's, I think there's also an absence. In their discussions and in so many discussions of Tamil connections with Southeast Asia, there's been a focus only on the ancient. Tagore, for example, showed much less interest in what were then huge contemporary Indian communities in Southeast Asia. For him, the long vanished past was what was interesting rather than the perhaps more complicated present of the 1920s. I think one of the really inspiring things about the National uh, Indian Heritage Center in Singapore uh, and counterparts across the region is that they are as interested in the present as in the past. And indeed they create a little bit of a bridge between these different histories. And I'd like to think for a second about how those different scales of history, as, as, uh, as Mr. Arun put it, you know, the 2000 years and the 200 years, um, how they map onto one another. Some of you uh, listening in today might well have visited Lamba Bujang, the Bujang Valley in Kedah. And this is one of the earliest archeological sites in Southeast Asia that show a, a vibrant Tamil merchant community there uh, several, uh, more than a thousand years ago date from about 700 or 800 AD. Um, and this was clearly a, a vibrant, thriving settlement of, of Tamil traders who were involved in uh, the trade in, in beads and in many other commodities across the Bay of Bengal. What interests me though, is how Lamba Bujang was discovered. I tell this story a little bit in my book, Crossing the Bay of Bengal. It was actually Tamil migrant workers in the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century who discovered this site while they were trying to clear the ground for rubber plantations. And of course, you know, the majority of the rubber tappers of Malaya that made Malaya the most prosperous colony in the British Empire were Tamil migrant workers. And as they were dig dig digging a drainage ditch, they suddenly started to stumble upon um, probably quite familiar statues, Ganesha statues, other icons, uh, very familiar structures that, that perhaps reminded them of temples. And it was only then um, that the British archeologist Courage Wales excavated the site and found that it was one of the largest and most extensive sites testifying to this ancient presence. So in that very moment, I see we see these different histories coming together, that you have uh, labor migrants who go to the plantations in Malaysia at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, uh, in their everyday work, in their hard toil, they uncover the traces of, in a sense, their own ancestors. Uh, who had been there several hundred years earlier, and, and this settlement had been buried over, you know, forgotten over the years. 
And I, I, I couldn't help but speculate in a sense, you know, what did these workers think they were seeing when they dug up this site? What was familiar? What was known uh, about what they were discovering that led them to, to have an inkling that this was something quite significant? Um, reminds me of the line from the great anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, who talked of the flu moment, where a single moment capture these very deep histories. The migration of Tamil labor to the plantations of Malaya, of course, was part of a much larger movement. And as Mr. Arun alluded to this, this is one of the largest movements of labor, of people in global history. It's on par with the movement of the Chinese to Southeast Asia. It's on par with the movement of Europeans across the Atlantic at the same time. And this is a shipping map from around 1900, and it shows the density of the steam shipping routes. Um, before the pandemic, I used to say this reminded me a little bit of the, the sort of uh, route maps of, of the budget carriers now, that they fly not just to major places, but to smaller cities as well. This is a shipping map, steam shipping map from 1900, and it shows just how densely connected this part of the world uh, was. This is a map of the routes of the British India Steam Navigation Company that uh, tried to establish a monopoly over uh, this shipping, though in fact they were challenged at various points. The, the Tamil nationalist Vio Chidambaram Pillai in the early 20th century tried to form a rival, a Swadeshi steam company, uh, though it didn't last for very long. On one estimate, uh, about 28 million passenger journeys going back and forth across the Bay of Bengal between approximately the middle of the 19th century and the 1930s. Not necessarily 28 million people because a lot of these people are making repeat journeys and indeed that, the sojourning is one of the characteristics of this migration, that people go back and forth, that over several generations perhaps, over a lifetime, one sees a, a repeated coming and going uh, back and forth. Um, let me say a little bit about the economic and political context for this mass movement. It, it really took place under the conditions that we might think of as the first wave of globalization. Um, some historians have gone much, much further back. Uh, one of my colleagues at Yale, Valerie Hansen, has just published a wonderful book called The World in the Year 1000, uh, showing how a were connecting the world you know, in, in much the same way on a smaller scale. Nevertheless, this late 19th century moment is certainly the moment of globalization by steamship, by railway, by telegraph line, a vast acceleration in the movement of not only of people, but of information, the printing press, of news, of financial information. And you see a, a British-centered world economy really developing. And the Bay of Bengal region becomes absolutely pivotal to this. Uh, not only does Malaya emerge as the major source of rubber in the world, uh, by the 1920s, Malaya is supplying the then uh, thriving US automobile industry with about 80% of its rubber. So we think of the Model T Ford, we think about how important that is in the global history of factory production. And there's a missing link there that we often forget, which is that it's the labor of, of Tamil plantation workers in Malaya that is an integral part of that story. Burma emerges as the largest rice exporter in the world, especially after the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. And that is a very important moment in a sense, bringing the Bay of Bengal region much closer to the rest of the world. Rangoon is by 1929 or 1930, uh, probably the second largest migration port in the world after New York City. Um, and, and in a sense, given the isolation of Rangoon in the second half of the 20th century, that's uh, almost unbelievable uh, to be able to imagine that Rangoon is second to New York as a port of migration. Burma becomes by far the number one destination for Indian migrants. In that case, most of them were Telugu speakers, but, but of course, many, many Tamil speakers went there as well, Bengali speakers. Um, Burma was ruled as part of British India until 1937. So in a sense, this was a domestic or an internal movement, even though it involved a sea journey for many of those who went. But yeah, Rangoon is the second largest port of migration in the world after New York, at least for a period of a few years. And these are the years in the 1920s and 30s that the sort of sheer diversity of the multiple 
South Asian diasporas are forged across the region. Um, the stories of Singapore and Malaysia will be most familiar to most of us here. Uh, Burma is a really important part of the story and Myanmar as it is now. But in fact, these movements reach other parts of the region that we talk about less. They reach Indochina. There's a wonderful book by the historian Natasha Pairodo about how uh, Tamils from Pondicherry, from French ruled Pondicherry, play a really important role in the French colonies in Indochina and Vietnam. Cambodia, where they go as magistrates and administrators and clerks, um, and in fact, are, are much more a part of the economy and society of Vietnam in particular than, than perhaps we remember. Um, Indonesia is another really important destination, not on the scale that you have Tamil movement to Singapore or to Malaysia, but nevertheless dispersed across the archipelago um, in textiles, um, labor migrants, there are some Tamil laborers who end up on the um, tobacco plantations of Sumatra, even though most of those are, are worked by, by Chinese migrant workers. Um, Thailand is another example, I think often forgotten. We have uh, the Punjabi communities of Thailand are well known still, but there are also Tamil communities that make it uh, to Bangkok and even to smaller places. And then there are hidden histories, because of course most of the Bay of Bengal is ruled by the British Empire. But the British Empire is certainly not the only political entity in the region. And in the archives, we have these traces, these hints, these suggestions of Tamil workers actually crossing these boundaries, sometimes even as a way to escape. Uh, so there are all of these letters in the uh, National Archives of India uh, from British officials in Malaya saying, look, our laborers are leaving the plantations and they're crossing the border into Thailand and we can't track them and we can't get them back. And as a historian, I'm really drawn to these hidden stories, these stories that perhaps only live on in family memory or in oral history, of which there are only these very fugitive traces in the archives. So if we turn to that question of, of how do the much deeper histories of cultural interaction shape the experience of Tamil and other Indian communities in Southeast Asia, one of the key parts to my answer, I think, is, is that it creates a sense of familiarity. That is why I chose the idea of the palimpsest as the title for this talk. It's also the title of my chapter in the book. Um, as, as Mr. Arun said, you know, a palimpsest is a text um, which has been written over many times. But what's interesting, of course, what makes it a palimpsest is when some of those earlier inscriptions, these earlier traces are still visible. And you can see it in architecture, not just in text. Um, you can see it in, in southern Spain with structures uh, that were mosques that become churches. You know, you can see it across South Asia as well, where, where what was there before remains visible, even when it is overlaid by, by something else. And I think that describes very well sort of long durée historical connection between the Tamil speaking people and Southeast Asia. Um, my colleague here at Yale, uh, Ruth Barnes, who's curator of our Indo-Pacific collections at the Yale Art Museum, uh, is a very distinguished historian of the textile trade. And, and she has described it as, as the feeling of a neighborhood. This idea of, of resonances and echoes and familiarities, which link the societies across the Bay of Bengal rim. And I, I like that idea because I think it resonates. Um, and of course, these cultures don't remain separate. And I mean, I think that is a major point that I've tried to make in all of the research I've done on this, that we always need to be thinking about Tamil diasporas, first of all, in the plural. There are, the Tamil diaspora itself is so diverse. It is diverse in terms of caste and religion and origin and occupation and background. There are multiple communities that at times see themselves as one and at other times are much more local in their orientation. So on the one hand, we need to think about a plurality of diasporas. On the other hand, we need to think of every single one of these diasporas, not in isolation, but in interaction. That is what makes Singapore such an interesting place for a historian of migration. Uh, these are not separate communities. They share public space, but they also share ritual. Um, I know that the, the, the previous talk in this series was by Torsten Schacher, who's the great historian of Tamil Muslim communities. Um, and he spoke and he writes in his chapter about the Nagur Dagga, 
Uh, this is the, the, the one in Penang, but of course there is one in Singapore, um, and there is the, uh, the large Nagar shrine in Nagar in Tamil Nadu. Um, and what's interesting about the Nagar Darga is that it is visited not only by Tamil Muslims, but by so many others, by Muslims of other backgrounds, but also by um, Tamil and Chinese who aren't Muslim. Uh, and so I think you have this kind of intersection. Um, this is the Erawan Shrine in Bangkok, again, a place which is a deeply multi-ethnic and multi-religious in the way, the very ordinary ways in which it attracts people. I think of the Loyang Temple in Singapore as, as very much a, a place of that kind where in a very unself-conscious way you see a mixing of cultural and religious traditions. And, and you know, just to give one final example, very familiar to many of you is of course the, the Chinese beginning to participate in Taikusam. And in fact, there's evidence of this from the beginning of the 20th century. Um, Again, what is it that makes uh, this ritual of penance seem familiar? And this is an open question, and I think it is one that we'll sort of ask ourselves um, and, and leave open. Perhaps we can come back to that in discussion. Another place these interactions are happening is in the printing press. Uh, Dinesh Satishan has a great chapter in, in the book on Tamils in Singapore, one of the two volumes of Sojourners to Settlers, where he talks about reformist movements. And the Singapore and Malaysian Tamil press is extraordinarily vibrant. Um, the middle image on the slide uh, gives you a sense that, you know, this is also a world of, of vibrant commercial advertising. Um, this is a world where new ideas about gender are uh, playing themselves out. This shows the modern Tamil woman. Um, this is from the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, Singai Nesan uh, becomes one of the early Tamil newspapers. And of course, then you get Tamil Murasa, which is very associated with an ideology of social reform. Uh, you get a cross-cutting of ideas. Uh, Periyari Viramsami visits Singapore, of course, and Malaysia in the late 1920s. And his ideas, the ideas of the self-respect movement, start to translate themselves. They're not just imported. They are translated into the specific context of what it is to live a modern life in a multi-ethnic city like Singapore, or like Kuala Lumpur, or like Penang. The printing press becomes a site for the articulation of identity. And what strikes me is that that identity is plural. It is fluid. It is not just a Tamil identity or an Indian identity. It is an identity that is constantly um, facing in different directions. Um, by the 30s, as early as the 1930s, you have a sense people actually articulating the idea that we are Tamils and we belong here in Singapore and Southeast Asia, um, and we have a certain allegiance to the Indian nationalist movement led by Mahatma Gandhi, um, and we are deeply involved in uh, local struggles for social reform. Uh, so I think what's interesting about this world is that it, it, is, it is very, very plural. And that's one reason I think historians have been so interested in studying the printing press, the 20s and 30s, would say that has been one of the most vibrant areas of historical research in the last decade or, or 15 years. Um, so moving towards the close of the story, I think what we see in the 1930s is a period of contraction. We see a period of, of rising tensions rising ethnic tensions, first as a result of the Great Depression. And as, as we all know, in, in times that are economically difficult, um, sometimes boundaries become firmer. Sometimes there is more of a sense of us in them. And that is what happens in the 1930s across Southeast Asia. It does not happen as starkly in Singapore and Malaysia as it does in Burma, where there is inter-ethnic violence begins to erupt and a lot of resentment on the part of Burmese against Indian migrant workers who are seen as, as taking their jobs and in a sense as, as, as occupiers. We can see the profound effects of this moment of the 1930s in language. And language is an excellent archive. Language can tell us so much about how cultural assumptions change. We see a transformation in the meaning of certain words. Kek in Thai, Kala in Burmese, Kling in Malaysia. These terms were often 
neutral in their implications to begin with in the 19th century. Kek meant guest or outsider. But these terms come to be derogatory. They come to suggest one who does not belong. And this is an age of, of global nationalisms, of borders going up, of, of much sharper divisions between us and them. And I have to say, as a historian, um, the discourse around migration in the last few years, and particularly in this country in the US, uh, ha has been uncomfortably resonant of that moment in the 1930s where these much stronger divisions come in. And I think what we see is multiple histories embedded in each of these words. And it is our responsibility as historians, I think, to, to go back to them, to recover their multiplicity of meanings, not to surrender them necessarily uh, to those who at this moment of the 1930s uh, sought the narrowest of definitions of, of who belongs. And so in conclusion, I, I would like to go back to this idea of, of settlers and what that might mean for us all. Um, after the Second World War, as, as you all know, there was a really sharp divergence in trajectories if we think about the history of Tamils in Southeast Asia. And maybe we could think of Singapore and Myanmar as two ends of that spectrum, where in Singapore there is uh, an incorporation and an absorption where Tamils become a, a vital part of the national fabric and identity. And in Myanmar on the other end of the spectrum, you have a mass exodus. Uh, First in 1942, but again in the 1950s and 1960s, you have the uh, often unwilling exit of a large part of the Indian population, by no means all of it, but a large part of the Indian population, several hundred thousand people leave Myanmar to go back to India, some of them as refugees, others uh, more of their own volition. Um, and indeed, there are projects now that are seeking to sort of reconstruct those memories of those communities, because in many ways they then disappear. Uh, their memories are intensely private memories. They live within families. There's been no public commemoration of that particular bond between Tamil Nadu and Myanmar. And, and perhaps the moment is, is a little bit more promising now for the restitution of those histories. Just a couple of weeks ago, I heard from a journalist at the Hindu in, in Chennai who's writing a story about what happens to some of these communities. Um, Renaud Ungreto, a French scholar, has also been doing some work on that. You think about uh, those of you who know Chennai well, Burma Bazaar, it, it began as just that. It began um, as a market um, of stalls of those who, who, who had been in Burma and who returned at some point in the 1940s or 1950s. And the question about being a settler is really who could be a settler and who wanted to be a settler. Those two things did not always match very neatly in the post-war world. You had people who wished to be settlers who were not accepted as such. You had people who were forced to be settlers who would rather have stayed sojourners, but that was no longer possible. And so I think what we see is these very complicated realignments of sojourning and settling in a post-colonial moment, in a moment where new nation states felt for understandable reasons that controlling who could come in and go out was essential to their national sovereignty. And I think if we think about these uh, divergent trajectories after the Second World War, uh, these are stories that remain to be told. They're your stories, many of you watching, as Mr. Ali said at the beginning. I think one of the most powerful achievements of Nalina and her team at IHC has been to create a new sort of archive, a community archive to capture the stories that often aren't preserved in government documents or in the annals of political history. And I think that by bringing together so many multiple personal stories, family stories, private stories, if we put them together almost like a collage, and that is often how I um, interpret the IHC's work, it is the bringing together of things that perhaps haven't been put together in that way before. We start to be able to tell new histories and we have new narratives. And these narratives are not linear narratives. They're not necessarily uh, large scale narratives, but they're about these points of intersection between different people's itineraries and routes and trajectories. 
Um, it reminds me of, of the British novelist, Hilary Mantel, um, one of the most brilliant historical novelists. And she says that what she tries to capture in her books is, quote, not the historian's chronology, but the way memory works in leaps, loops, flashes. And I think that, that non-linear way of telling stories, something that is also made possible in new ways by, by digital technologies, by new ways of visualizing. Um, I'm struck always by, by the map at the IHC that shows uh, from sort of particular points of origin in South India, how different groups, different people end up in Singapore. And I can imagine a project like that's multiplied across the region uh, going far beyond Singapore. And I think that that project is an ongoing project. It is a project that is at the interface between the world of heritage, the world of academic history, the world of, of popular history and popular consciousness. And I think that it's a meeting point that we haven't explored enough so far. And I'm very glad to be part of this seminar and all of these conversations that I think are opening up new uh, frontiers. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abrit. Thank you very much. You, you had us riveted uh, to our seats for the full duration of your presentation uh, for good reasons too. Um, you know, it, it, it makes me wonder, makes me, me um, think almost wishfully, wouldn't it be wonderful if historians thought of themselves as storytellers too? Um, you know, until I read, as a schoolboy, until I read the novel Pueli Luarutoni, I did not know that there was a thriving uh, Tamil mercantile community in Indonesia. Uh, because my school history books didn't speak of those accounts. I, I find your presentation today so fascinating for one particular reason. I think it, it addresses a specific concern that history runs the constant danger of being selective in what it wants to take account of. And, and I thank you once again you know, for illuminating many aspects of uh, our history that has remained unexplored for most parts and uh, for giving the, the, the possibility or, or inviting um, young explorers, you know, to, to take fresh perspectives towards the, uh, the, the, the same subject. Uh, now I invite uh, Arun once again to engage uh, Professor Sunil Amrit in a discussion. Arun. Thank you. Uh, Professor Amrit, I join Ali and many others uh, in thanking you for a very rich and very eloquent uh, dissertation. Um, I'd like to pick up on what was almost at the close, which is settling and sojourning. And I think- Arun, sorry, know... sorry for the interruption. I just forgot yeah. one announcement that I-, I Ah, heard. okay, uh, sure. Okay, for the participants, uh, please feel free to send in your questions. Uh, we, we have space for about three or four questions. So uh, keep them coming and uh, I'll try to take the questions uh, as we go along after the discussion. Sorry, Arun, thank you. No problem, yeah. Uh, settling and sojourning, uh, you made the point that sometimes it is not the choice of the individuals. Uh, and that still happens, you know, we still have a lot of sojourners who uh, migrate and the settlement is not solely decided by themselves, but by governments, by circumstances and so on. Now, do you get the sense that those who settle uh, the Tamil diaspora, and you, you, you actually use the word diasporas quite often, to uh, bring to the attention, uh, to our attention, the plurality of what we might think of a very homogeneous, uh, monolithic uh, Tamil diaspora. And that in itself is interesting, which I'll pick up later. Do you think the settlement in uh, Singapore and Southeast Asia was mostly circumstantial that they were, it was not of their own volition but really because of what they were conditioned to or forced to? What's your impression? I think there's a historical shift that happens around the 1920s and 1930s. 
before that, I think there was very little intention of settlement on the part of, I would say, the majority of Tamil migrants to Southeast Asia. In fact, the normal pattern for people was being able to come and go. And I think that you have whole districts of Tamil Nadu, which in a sense build their security mm. on that expectation that mobility was a cyclical thing that would continue. Mm. Um, mm. And when I've done oral histories, it's so common to hear the story, well, I never meant to settle there. Mm. Um, circumstances shifted. And I think there are two circumstances which really do uh, totally sort of shift the balance towards settlement. Uh, one is the depression. Mm. Um, that's the first time in about 50 years, from 1930, for the first time in about 50 years, you see more people leaving Singapore, Malaysia to go back to India than arriving. And, and that was a reversal of a pattern of half a century. Um, and that was because there were no jobs, but it was also because the first time the British in Singapore and Malaysia start to implement uh, entry controls. Mm -hmm. There were none until then. Um, those entry controls, however, and this is important, don't apply to women. And I think the gender balance of the migration has a lot to do with this whole sojourning and settling thing. Uh, the migration was overwhelmingly male in the 1870s, 1890s. Mm -hmm. People often left their families behind. Yeah. You start to see large scale movement of Tamil women to Singapore from the 1920s and 30s. And it's when people have families locally that, mm -hmm. that they tend to settle. Uh, but of course, the circumstances of the Second World War also, I think, tell us a lot about who settles and who doesn't, because many people leave Burma and because of political changes completely out of their control, they can't go back. And yeah. I would say that, you know, many who left Burma in 1942 would not have known that they could never return. Um, and, and, you know, similarly, it's true the other way around that those who end up staying in Singapore and Malaysia uh, might not have intended to stay. But after the upheavals of the war, I, I can imagine a, a deep sense of, okay, I'm, go I'm going to sort of stay here and, and make my life where, where I am. So I think it's a mixture of things. I think you start to see a more of an intention to settle by the 20s. Yeah. I, I suppose the emergence of the nationalistic modern nation state, which requires citizenship and not some kind of, you know, uh, indentured labor, also obliges a lot of people to make their choice. Do you want to stay here and be a citizen or you want to go back? Now, in comparison with Chinese, because they too have a very big presence in Southeast Asia, and certainly in Singapore, you know, that's the overwhelming majority of them. How do you see the difference in their sojourning and settling and the Tamil diasporas? So I think there's a real um, need for more comparative work. I and mean, some of it has been happening. And in fact, I was I attended a conference at ISIS about 10 years ago, which was about the Indian and Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia. But I think that that in a way that project is only beginning. There are some great similarities. And I think one of the similarities is precisely in that pattern of sojourning, which gradually then turns to settlement mm -hmm. at around the same time, and sometimes in relation to the same circumstances. Um, I think what's quite different is sort of social networks. One of the things that's um, particularly in the earlier phase of migration, most of the Chinese migrants who come to Southeast Asia, they come to work for Chinese employers. Mm -hmm. That's not true of the Tamil migrants. Um, and it's true to a larger extent of those who go to the cities, like Singapore in particular. But if you think about plantation workers in particular, mm. they're, they're largely working for European planters. And I think that some of the difference is simply that, you know, India was ruled by the British Empire. Um, and while China was sort of under pressure from the British Empire, it was never ruled by, by anybody. So, so there is this sense of, of, I think, a greater autonomy in some of these Chinese migrant networks where Chinese merchants, in a sense, were the key brokers. Uh, whereas I think that takes a bit longer to sort of happen in the case of Tumbling. You also use the word plurality when you describe uh, the Tamil diaspora. Uh, I think that some Tamils feel that we're all alike. And of course, some non-Tamils also feel all Tamils are alike. But your study uh, clearly shows that there are Tamil diasporas. And I also want to connect this to your own experience in Singapore, you know, where you live for nearly 10 years. And, and you saw firsthand that Tamils the non-Tamil Indians and, of course, the non-Indians, all living cheek by jowl uh, right here, uh, you know, next to you, 
Um, and I wonder whether these personal experiences to get some thoughts, and especially also connect you to the Bay of Bengal history, you know, uh, which had been forgotten for quite some time. Could you share something uh, about that? Yes, of course. So I, it's interesting because I think my own family moved to Singapore um, at the beginning of a new generation of migration. So my parents came in 1980 and they were, I suppose, one of the sort of earlier generation of the sort of new professional migrants from India who came in the 80s. And of course, then that that migration became far, far larger by the 80s and 90s. Um, and so in a sense that I saw already just from my experience of growing up that there were multiple Tamil communities. There were the long settled uh, Singaporean Tamil communities that had been Singapore for generations and generations. Uh, there were those like my family who came in the late 70s, early 80s. And then as I was growing up, you know, and as a teenager, I actually spent 17 years in Singapore, I saw many, many more families arriving from India. Mm -hmm. And in, in that sense, it felt like uh, that was something new that was happening. And of course, that's continued to happen since then. Um, so that itself just gave me on a personal level a sense that there are many different Indian communities here. And there are moments when they come together as Tamils or as Indians. Uh, there are moments where there is a real sense of, of commonality, of community. And there are moments where, uh, for, for various reasons, whether it has to do with interest, whether it has to do with occupation, um, that, that there are different orientations that there are different communities and and i think it's important to emphasize both i mean the point is not to say there's no such thing as a tamil diaspora or we need to think about is its internal difference because i think at moments that identity is powerful it means a lot to people um it is just that that is not the only identity and there are times where more local identities um um anecdotally i i know it's true that even now if you look at um current Tamil migrant workers who've come from Tamil Nadu to Singapore are often working in the construction industry. Um, you see there's a real localism to that as well as a kind of broader solidarity. There's a localism that people who come from a certain town or a certain village uh, have family, familial links or they have um, kinship links. And then at other moments, you know, there are other communities that sort of enfold them. And I think just as a historian in general, thinking about diasporas, I'm always interested in sort of an inward and an outward looking uh, perspective. Yeah. Yeah. What divides us and what unites us, but also what do we then have in common with other diasporas? I mean, I've always been very interested in the interactions, not just the comparisons, but the interactions between Indian and Chinese migrants in Southeast Asia, because they arrive at the same time and they're often sharing space. Yeah, well, uh, that uh, leads me to my final point, because there are a number of other people waiting to, uh, you know, engage you. Uh, you showed a picture of uh, Taipusum, you know, and, and uh, the central uh, character was a Chinese gentleman who was, uh, you know, and we just celebrated Taipusum in Singapore just yesterday. And that actually relates to the concept of neighborhood. You know, in Singapore, because we are packed uh, so closely in such a small little island, this idea of neighborhood, even with another race, another religion and the language is, you know, it's not that alien. But you use the same word neighborhood as felt by people, you know, many centuries ago, even though they were divided vastly by the oceans, but they did feel they were in a neighborhood, that they were neighbors. How, did, how do you relate to that, you know, across distance uh, and, and also across all kinds of different cultures? How did they feel that neighborhood? I think this is something we we can only sort of grasp in in fragments or in traces because you know of course so many of these people left us very little um, indication of how they saw the world. We have to infer that from material culture or from what uh, what we can see that was left behind. And I think that a sense of a neighborhood. Um, comes from a sense of recognition, and the sense of recognition comes from the movement of particular cultural practices, particular artifacts, and we can explain those movements really by the longevity of commercial and trading relationships in the Eastern Indian Ocean in the Bay of Bengal. The fact that um, uh, certain rituals, for example, are, you know, if you look at even medieval travel accounts, mm. um, look at the uh, travelogue of Ma Huan, who goes with Zheng He's fleet uh, 
through Southeast Asia. And, and at certain points, you know, what he is expressing is a sense of recognition that, oh yes, I understand this um, performance of a scroll. This reminds me of something that, that I know. And so I think there is this sense that you see even in quite early, albeit very elite sort of travel writings, uh, Arab travelers as well, of, of some sort of recognition. And, and of course, religious practice plays a big role in that. Mm -hmm. to, the, you know, to the extent that religious practices are very early to move across the Indian Ocean, um, that is often what provides that sense of familiarity. Yeah. Travelers, traders, and finally troops. They all, uh, I guess, uh, contributed to this uh, sense of neighborhood. Uh, I, I have to hand you back to Ali. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Amrit and uh, Arun. We, we have uh, quite a number of questions. We may not have time for all the questions. Um, now, there is a question about the uh, Jawi Pernakan community. Let me let me just uh, scroll. Okay, um, let me move on to the another question that I have before me. This is to Professor Amrit. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak. The archival material you screened was delightful, but I wonder about the extent to which they privilege the stories of wealthy elite upper caste Tamils. Obviously, this is a problem for all historians, but the problem is acute in the case of South Asians in Southeast Asia, because South Asians who left behind fewer written records were also the ones that, uh, ones at the receiving end of imperial exploitation. I'm thinking of the plantation workers and the likes. How do historians correct for this? Where, where can we find these stories? I think that's a vitally important that's question. That's Deepak Warrior, by the way. Um, thank you, thank you, Deepak, for that question. I think it's a vitally important question. It's, in a way, it is the fundamental challenge of doing social history of non-elite groups. And, and I agree with you that that is particularly acute in this case. Um, and I showed you pictures of the sort of textual archive, and I think that is particularly sort of oriented towards a much more elite upper caste Tamil community at the newspapers, the print culture. Uh, but I, I would say there is really interesting work going on about plantation labor. Some of that is, is classic work going back to the 1980s, 1990s. Um, Dr. P. Ramasamy in, in Malaysia, who mm -hmm. was at USM at the time, has also been in politics, uh, did this wonderful uh, book back in 1994 on, on Malaysian plantation work of the labor regime discipline. Uh, more recently, is a very, very talented young historian called Arun Umadatta, who did a PhD at NUS, uh, who's just got a book, has just come out, called Fleeting Agencies. And she's really managed to capture the experience of, of Tamil women on the plantations. And the way she's done that is just by an extraordinary creative reading of the archive that no, they don't leave many records. But if you very creatively read court cases, um, stray traces, um, oral history, of course, is very, very important to that sort of ability to recover the voices that aren't usually in the archives. Um, and I think putting those things together, there will always be limits, I think, to how far we can reconstruct uh, the life worlds, the perspectives, the experiences um, of those who are not elite, who are not literate, who are working on the plantations, who are sort of receiving end of imperial exploitation. But I think there are efforts on the way to do that. And I think some of them are very creative efforts. I think it has to do with rethinking the archive and not just, you know, historians are trained first and foremost to go to the government archives. Um, and I think over the last 30 years or more, uh, you know, songs, folk songs, performances, these are all archives too, material culture archive, the landscape of the plantations and archive. I found that very powerful when I was doing my work on, on plantation labor, that if we, if you walk around, if you talk to people, um, at least some of those stories then begin to come out. Those which, as you quite rightly point out, aren't there in the in the print archive. In the contemporary context, uh, I'd like to uh, point out that my uh, co-editor and co-moderator of this session, Nalina Gopal, is actually doing something about it for Singapore's uh, history of the new, which you also referred to earlier in your intro, that, you know, individuals. And some of these people don't belong to the upper crust. They are very ordinary people too. Yeah. Okay. Um, for the last question, we only have time for one more. You know, I've always, 
wondered why isn't the um, the history or the um, of the Tamil is not uh, written in Tamil. You know, it was, uh, and um, this question sort of resonates with thinking. I think it, it's towards this end that uh, IHC's effort um, of publishing the Sajnas who settles in Tamil is a very important one. Uh, Praveen Kumar, he has a question um, in the same spirit. What do you think is the role of the Tamil language in the increasingly integrated uh, environment in the new lands of Southeast Asia? Uh, does or did it start to fade away into the background uh, as it gets spoken less and less over the generations? Uh, both of you gentlemen, your take on it. Prof Amrit first. <laughs> um, I, I would say that, again, you have you have multiple experiences, but I would say for the most part, it doesn't fade away. I mean, I think one of the things that's very interesting is that in Southeast Asia, you start to get Tamil language movements and you get those from the 1930s, again, very much in the 1950s. And in some ways, you know, Singapore and, and Malaysia remain these centers of Tamil cultural production. You know, they have their own Tamil radio programs and, and television programs and literature festival. And the first ever World Tamil Congress happened in, in KL in 1968. Um, there is this, uh, so I, I think there continues to be an investment in language. Um, I think you have a very different experience in Myanmar where in Myanmar you have much more because of the political situation you have there you perhaps do see more of a sort of loss of language and you see a much more of an assimilation to a, a, a Burmese uh, not just language but modes of dress etc though though perhaps privately you know language is also still spoken but I, I do remember when I was doing work in Myanmar how many um even of the older generation people of Indian origin that I met said well they don't really have the language anymore um but I don't think that's true of Singapore, Malaysia. Um, and it, indeed, I think it's less and less true because I, th I think you have a younger generation that is very invested in, in an idea of roots and in trying to explore those roots and in trying to understand. And, and you know, I could only wholeheartedly agree that I think it's wonderful that the book is coming out in Tamil, um, not just in, in Southeast Asia, but, but even in India, I mean, there is a real sort of language divide within the historical profession and most academic history, even in India, is written in English. And I mean, that's a real problem. That's a real divide. I mean, I think that's a real uh, structural difficulty of, of, of the scholarly world, as, particularly as far as academic history is concerned. Arun, any thoughts on uh, Well, just to touch on the um, survival of Tamil in Malaysia and Singapore and the decline of Tamil, the critical role of the state. It is government policy in Singapore to make it an official language. Uh, in the, even in Malaysia, the government recognizes Tamils and Tamil language as an integral part of Malaysia. And there is no indigenization in terms of dress names and things like that that happen in uh, Myanmar or Burma. So there is a very big difference in the role of the state. Beyond the state, unless the community is invested in itself, this language, this culture will not survive. The state cannot prop it up. So it behooves on the community to, you know, to, to make it survive, flourish. I hope it will flourish, but the community support is the most single most critical factor, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Amrit, for a wonderful session yet again, and Arun for that uh, engaging uh, conversation that you had with uh, Professor Abrit. Uh, many questions are still coming in, but I regret um, and my apologies because we just don't have enough time to address all your questions. And now it um, leaves me with um, the, the, the honor of inviting Nalina Gopal, the IHC curator, to provide the closing remarks. Um. Thank you, Ali. I think in some ways my predicament is the same as IHC's in that we come, uh, you know, several, several uh, moments in, in terms of IHC, I should say, hundreds of years after the fact of when events have taken place and we're trying to reconstruct the past in the best way that we can, um, you know, completely acknowledging the fact that there are aspects of history that have remained untold, unpublished. And for us to really delve into collective memory um, that is really resting in the community to see how best we can tell the story. Um, so for me, you know, now that I've come after three individuals who've been 
always generous to us with the information they share, the absolute inspiration they are in the work uh, that we do, as well as, of course, in terms of um, just being there and uh, for us to reach out to at any time, uh, you know, in terms of advice. Um, all I can say is our absolute heartfelt gratitude. Um, so let me begin with uh, Sunil. So Sunil, um, I think my gratitude starts with really um, you unpacking the title of the publication for us uh, during your talk. I think you've done it better than uh, we as editors perhaps uh, did so um, ourselves on many occasions. And I think it's absolutely crucial that people understand the journey of migration from sojourning to settlers. And I know that in your publication, you've used the word circulation as well. And I think that's uh, very much a poignant um, note for us to remember at this time when transportation is so suspended. So um, thank you for doing uh, absolute justice to uh, understanding the title of the publication um, and for expressing it so eloquently. Um, and also, I think, um, you know, for uh, impressing, I think, on the audience, the need to reimagine the past and uh, the real absolute need to express history in ways that we could do so at our individual level. I mean, I would also urge anybody who's uh, here who is, uh, you know, somebody of migrant roots um, to see if you could reach out to your grandparents parent or your parent and just hear the stories they have to tell you and document it maybe with your family's archive of photographs and you know even diaries that people might have because every little drop really counts in the ocean that is the history of the migrant diaspora so um, thank you Sunil for encouraging I think not just institutions but for individuals to really reimagine the past and to fill in the gaps where there might be several and of course I think also the important point about bridging um, you know the past and the present in ways that we can and not being limited by perhaps uh, you know material heritage and to really see how we can fill in the gaps perhaps by commissioning contemporary works the way we do sometimes or perhaps you know with old history or um, you know with just acknowledging some things in text I think it is important to see how we can always remind I think uh, you know audiences that there is very much that special connecting cord, um, you know, in Southeast Asia for diasporas with the past, that there is really this long durée narrative that everybody who's here at this moment in time is adding to in some ways for the future generation to really hear about. So thank you for making these really important points and for being uh, this absolute generous historian who always, always shares his research so openly. And, uh, you know, your, your research has been definitely one that we delve to, to see, uh, you know, what there might be that we could definitely enrich our narratives at the center with. So uh, thank you. And of course, I must also move on to thank Mr. Arun, um, who has been such an able chair for this series. And uh, of course, will continue to be the series moderator for the last session, which is to take place in March. And I will leave that to Ali to say, but we would, of course, like to take this opportunity again to thank him for being such an able chair and for also his infinite dedication and passion in championing championing Singapore's Tamil heritage. Um, our publication, Sojourners to Settlers, Tamils in Southeast Asia and Singapore, as all three speakers before me have said, is to be launched in Tamil um, in 2021 during the Tamil Language Festival. And it will be a first for both IHC and the Institute of Policy Studies, who are the co-publishers of this publication. So we are, of course, very much looking forward to it. And, uh, you know, we hope that it will help to bridge this gap that sometimes there might be in terms of how uh, knowledge and information is consumed simply because of the language it is transmitted in. Um, and um, I would also be, uh, you know, very remiss if I did not thank uh, our collaborators and supporters. So, you know, this publication as well as the webinar series wouldn't have been possible without the generous support of the Tamil Language Learning and Promotion Committee, Yuva Bharati International School and Tamil Language Council, our absolute gratitude to them. And uh, lastly, my thanks, of course, to the series host, Ali, um, who himself is, of course, one of the most recognizable faces of the Tamil diaspora in Singapore. And he brings with him an absolute uh, internal understanding of the community. So we're so grateful that he agreed to be the host. And on that note, I'll return you all to the good hands of Ali. Thank you. Thank you, Nalina. Thank you. You were quite generous yourself. Thank you. Um, yes, and this is the um, this this brings the session to a close. Just before that, the next session, uh, just 
for you to take note is on the is to be held on the 27th of March 2021 and will be held in Tamil. Um, it'll be, I think it'll be featuring the Singaporean author K. Kanagalata. And should you like to register for this session, please email us or tune to IHC Spitex and uh, Facebook pages. And I think that's all I have before me. Thank you everyone for a wonderful Saturday evening. I hope to see you again in March. Thank you.